So how many of you have um, smartphones with you, please? Raise your hand. OK, take them out, please. Can you imagine not having them anymore? This is what I often hear. Can you imagine being untethered for a few minutes? So this is the, the point I want to talk um, to you, with you about, is what happens to us when we're so tethered to our sets of technologies that we forget about this notion of randomness, this notion of how we accidentally meet people. Um, we have heard from Duncan about having sort of a prescriptive view of how technology is used. But on the other hand, I'm very, very uh, interested as an observer and as an accidental technologist on how technology is used. For example, how many of you have been in restaurants where you see mom and dad or grandparents or whatever having uh, some kind of tablet in front of them, the children, and they're not communicating with one another? They're not even having a conversation. And so we have to think about, for me, that is a notion of what is this technology doing? How is it affecting our social form? We think about smart cities and we think about smart X and smart Y. And then we've talked about Sophia and artificial intelligence. And as an observer, as an accidental engineer, I do confess, as an observer, I have deep concerns. And so there are three questions I want you to think about during the course of my talk today. What is human? What are the attributes of being human? Then we have this notion of virtual worlds and um, augmented selves and augmented reality. How many of you are gamers? How many of you love games? How many of you sit on that and, and, and video and just uh, listen and play and, and have a competitive experience? How many of you love it and want to remain in that world? The second question is, what is your reality? We see our reality is blending every single moment, virtual, augmented. So we have what is human as a question, what is your reality? And another observation I have is digital personas. How many of you have avatars? How many of you are avatars? Our digital personas are now in many, many ways manifested and instantiated. And so we have digital identities and forms that we leave on, on the internet and social media, and do they reflect ourselves? So the third question to ask is, what defines you? So what is human? What world and reality are you choosing to live in? And what defines you in the process? This photograph is a picture of my mother's last birthday. She passed away on September 17, 2013. And although this photograph is very emotional for me, because she was not only my mother, she was my best friend. Standing next to her is my father, and standing behind her is my sister-in-law. The story here is how they met. It was completely unplanned. It was completely random. Now, I should confess, my mother, my mother comes from Lebanon, and my father's an American, so you can kind of put together what that will look like. My father was looking to go to a party, and he knocked on the wrong door. He did. Opens the door is my mother, this beautiful, beautiful woman, and uh, he's like, oh my god. Um, can you give me the address of blah, blah, blah? My mother dutifully gave him the address. And um, do you think my father went to that party that night? He didn't. He went home. He went back to his place of home. And he actually was thinking about this woman whom he just accidentally met. And my mother didn't think about him. But uh, that's another story. 
And, um, and so what happened was, he, it took him three years to pursue her, and they got married. They had five beautiful children, and um, she was the matriarch of that, of that family. And gosh, by a random experience, would I be here speaking to you today? That's the question. The story of my sister-in-law is an interesting one, too. Think about missing a train or missing a plane. In this case, it was a plane. And she sits accidentally, not planned, not programmed, next to my youngest brother, my baby brother. And during the course of a five-year journey, a flight to New York, they talk and talk and talk, and they find that they had so many things in common that by the end of that journey, something was clicking. And it wasn't programmed. And two years later, they got married. Be two beautiful children. So the notion here is, what do you do with the loss of this whole serendipity? These were serendipitous, beautiful moments. And they weren't programmed. They weren't programmed. And think about your partner, your husband, or your wife, and how you met them. Think about that random experience, maybe. We were talking earlier about that. And so it's very, very poignant to me because technology is coming more and more embedded into our life. Now, I'm going to switch a little bit because Duncan has talked about the brain, but we're going to talk about the brain a little more because we're just getting to know the topic of the brain. The brain has been a study, uh, an object of study for so many years, and it's continued to be a study. And um, we're talking about interfaces, brain interfaces. There's the medicinal value of the study. Can you imagine looking at stimulating neurons for people who are completely par paralyzed? There's also the notion of how do I take the brain and now become part of a closed system such that I use the power of the brain to move objects, and maybe in a way that's military. So now we start the potential wep weaponization, if you will, of the brain. And so I have a colleague, her name is Dr. Mary Lou Jepson, and she's actually thinking about having a portable MRI for the brain. And now we're thinking about telepathic messaging. I can read your thoughts, you can read my thoughts, and the sources of truth are no longer secrets. And that is happening very much today. Think about programmable. What is human and where do you want to be in all of these sets of realities? How many of you are familiar of the, multi, the first multimodal brain symphony? This happened in 2009. How many of you are musicians in the room? Musicians in the room. So think about this as the first, when we get into programmable notions of creativity, this symphony occurred in 2009. And at what it was, is what you had neurons, you had this sort of interf this head interface that was attached to your skull. And you weren't playing the violin as we would play. You weren't playing the trumpet. You were actually using your brain without your body to instrument. You were actually creating notes. And so now you're no longer swaying with the music. And they actually positioned this phenomenon as brain concert without the body. So now, does our, are we becoming software? Are we becoming some notion of a new entity such that we no longer need our body anymore? What about when we have behavioral challenges with children? Maybe they're, they have some kind of short circuit in their brain. Now, there's a medicinal value, if you will, to addressing that. But do we become so, so very prescriptive that we program somebody to become different? 
that that individual does no, no longer has the aha moment in the classroom, no longer is able to choose his or her friends. There's one side that we, we address, but there's the other side that we have the potential, if you will, of over-rotating. And so I watch further and further as an observer when we look at these sets of technologies and I wonder about the ethics that are embedded. The questions that we should be asked when we create technology sets. For what purpose? It's a very fine balancing act in our society. I should also say that there is the notion of taking your own DNA swab for children who are misbehaving and spitting on bu bus drivers, which has occurred in Birmingham, England, by the way, was given to the police department without the knowledge of the parents. And these children were put in the database as future troublemakers. This is the thing to, to, to ask ourselves the question, should there be a red line? And if there is a red line, what would that look like? I'm in the second life. What about the first life? You know, I've been involved in these avatar discussions and these avatar com uh, conferences, and they're really unique, but I don't see the, f the faces because I'm hidden behind some kind of figure. It is so fascinating to look at what that means to us. It's first life, it's second life, and we choose not to really show ourselves anymore. And yet, you are now in my world. My world is even more programmable. Imagine when I asked the question about gaming and what gaming is to you. Imagine being treated with the augmented realities for post-stress uh, traumatic uh, syndrome. Imagine all of that, that I'm so immune. And imagine this, and this is a theoretical or a hypothetical, that we're all in this augmented world, and by the way, this is a used case. And I take your avatar, and I disguise, I actually co-opt your avatar, and I actually use you to kill you. Now, what is death? Would you be reporting it? And it's a photorealistically self that I've just uh, defined. And how do we define death? And how would the laws and legal entities change as a result of that? These are very, very poignant questions to ask. Because people now, we're not talking about cyberbullying anymore, ladies and gentlemen. We're not even talking about cyberstalking. We're talking about an immersive world which is reflective of the world we see and some of which we choose to remain in. Oh, but I can tag you. Do you know if these glasses are the glasses that I should be using them for or are they something else? I am living my entire life in an augmented world that I want to live in. It is my virtual reality and I choose not to take out of myself I choose not to extricate myself from that reality. Oh, should I have a serendipity button on? Or should I have a serendipity button off? And what I think is very interesting is that there are glasses that are being made. They'll be available to you. They're not gonna be the ones where you have sort of this funny object thing. They'll be the ones that will would look normal, and when you look down, you will be programmed because you'll have a text message. Down means, here's your augmented world. Here's your programmable messages. Here's your programmable overlay of another sets of reality. And, oh, by the way, we have even more interesting space here in the automobile industry, where you will never get lost again, not just because of GPS, but because what we'll have on the window is actually a view. Go left, go right, go straight ahead, you can see it, you can see it in an augmented way. You will never get lost again, but do you want to be lost? Maybe that's how you meet your partner someday. We don't know. And you know, we're even defining a new species. So the person on the left is Neil Harbinson, 
And the person on the right is Dr. Stephen Brown, um, Mann. Neil has a very, very severe condition. And he has a condition called, he has very severely, completely colorblind. And what he's done, he's created this antenna where he actually sees color by listening by music, by music tones. This antenna is embedded into his skull. He's an artist, he's a musician, and he's defined this new species. Right, it's a cyborg. And Dr. Stephen Mann has talked about this whole notion of surveillance versus surveillance. And these people have stated that those devices that you see are part of their organs. And they have convinced legal authorities that this is the case, and that we have an, a, a, a very interesting opportunity to actually start to evolve ourselves. What is human? And it's interestingly enough that this whole notion of transhuman or trans species is coming up more and more. It's not about the medicinal value that you have in terms of embedded, what is embedded and what it augments you, the species, you know. It's not that at all. But now we have a, a responsibility, according to Neil, to start transforming ourselves. So I think it becomes extraordinarily interesting to see that space. What about these people? How did they meet? Were they programmed to meet? Was it an augment? What is, was it, maybe they met because they missed the train? They missed a plane? Maybe they met for some other reason, but they were not programmed to do so. It is the serendipitous moments, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that counts in our lives. And we need to be, in my opinion, so cognizant of that. But I don't know about you, you know, when we think about the questions, the three questions I asked about what is human and what world you wish to live in and the realities that you are defining for yourselves and what most importantly defines you. What most importantly defines you? But I think it is a perfect and wonderful opportunity to start embracing chaos.